friends, hello again. I hope you you weathered the trial of the AstraZeneca speech, much like all the participants in the phase three trial, a little vaccination joke. Uh, and that I, I hope that you're, you're all geared up to learn more about vaccines. Odds are everyone here has already read up on the topic a little bit, not necessarily on the AstraZeneca, but maybe on vaccines altogether, because I think it's one of the things that it has gripped the, the, the common psyche of our various societies. And as such, um, I, I assume that some of what I'm going to say will be redundant uh, for some, but nevertheless, I hope that it's useful. So I was speaking in my consecutive about, or in my first speech, about the AstraZeneca virus, sorry, <laughs> the AstraZeneca vaccine, and it um, and and why it might be a cause for concern for some and whether that concern is valid uh, in this next segment which is going to be somewhat longer i'd like to discuss still that a little bit which is to say figures uh, on mortality and mortality rates and the odds therefore of, of dying from any particular cause and also discuss uh, the various types of vaccines and see why, I mean, not so much see why they're effective, but perhaps just look at how they've been administered and, and whether there's cause for concern. So to begin with, let's look at the vaccine types. Um, there are a lot of different technologies used, a lot of different processes to develop vaccines. And some of them may, might seem something straight out of a science fiction movie. For instance, uh, you have amongst some of the more common vaccine types, uh, what are called inactivated vaccines. Inactivated vaccines are vaccines that are used uh, that and, and that include a dead version of the particular virus or germ that causes a disease. Uh, inactivated vaccines usually provide a moderate level of immunity because your body is not going to have as much of an immune reaction to a dead virus as to a live one. Um, nevertheless, sometimes it's the safest version because obviously once a, a virus or another germ has been inactivated, it's not going to come back to life. So there's no risk of something unexpected happening and that you're actually catching the disease from it. Um, to name a few examples of types of diseases where inactivated vaccines are used, you have hepatitis A, you have uh, the vaccine against the common flu, as well as against polio and rabies. So, so some things that are quite common. Um, then you have what are called live attenuated vaccines. So as the name implies, these are live viruses that you get injected with, but they've been weakened significantly so that they normally should not be able to spread and multiply in your system and should be targeted by your immune system. Now, live vaccines um, tend to have a much stronger, um, tend to provoke a much stronger and more longer lasting immune response than the previous inactivated vaccines because the vaccines contain live in, uh, causes for, uh, of infection and as such are seen as a, as a genuine threat by your organism, by your body. Um, often one or two doses of most live vaccines can give you protection for your entire life against a particular germ or disease that it causes. Uh, nevertheless, live vaccines have some limits. For instance, because live vaccines contain a small amount of the weakened live virus, some people should first consult with their GPs before getting them. Because, for instance, if you have a weakened immune system, which might be because of uh, a previous illness like cancer and you're, because you're, you're currently still in treatment for that cancer, uh, because uh, you're a woman and you're pregnant, uh, there may be other reasons as well why your immune system is weakened. Um, you might have to be careful because, again, we're talking about a live, vac a live virus that is injected. Also, live attenuated vaccines need to be kept cool since they don't travel well. Uh, that means that you cannot use them in countries with limited access to refrigerators or perhaps with 
problems maintaining a steady supply of electricity or other situations that might keep you from keeping them cool enough systematically. Again, let's look at a few examples. So one of the most common live attenuated vaccines that is administered in the Western world is the MMR vaccine. MMR stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. These are very common childhood ailments. And so almost all adults having been born and grown up in these countries are inoculated with the MMR vaccine. Um, there are some others though, smallpox. The smallpox vaccine is also a live attenuated vaccine. There is a chickenpox vaccine, but most people don't get it because most people simply get the disease at a relatively young age. And once you've gotten the disease, you're not immune contrary to popular thinking, but it does tend to reduce the chance of getting it again. And if you do catch it again later in life, the symptoms tend to be much weaker. Uh, and then there's also yellow fever, which might be something relevant if you've traveled to a tropical part of the world. The next category of vaccines is, the, is a relatively new category called the mRNA vaccine. mRNA stands for messenger RNA. And if this sounds a little odd, and if you're thinking DNA, RNA, what's the difference? Well, you're right, RNA and DNA are connected. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of genetics here, but the mRNA vaccine is one of the new groundbreaking technologies used in particular to develop the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Pfizer vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. And in fact, researchers have been studying on studying how to produce mRNA vaccines and trying to develop the technology for decades. Uh, mRNA vaccines work by creating proteins that tend to trigger an immune response in, in the patient. Uh, mRNA vaccines have several benefits compared to other types of vaccines, including that they can be manufactured much more quickly once you've developed the technology, of course. And because they don't contain a live virus, there is no risk in this case either of causing a disease in the person that gets vaccinated. Then you have another category, which is something of a mouthful, which is why I, I tried to put it in the terminology on the Excel spreadsheet that you had access to. Um, and I highly recommend looking at it now if you haven't, because I'd put it in and then it was deleted. And so I had to put it in again, but only at the beginning, beginning, beginning of this session. So the, the terms in question are subunit, recombinant, polysaccharide, and conjugate vaccines. Uh, what these vaccines do is that they, they basically have pieces, but just specific pieces of the germ that you're trying to become immune to. That might mean some protein from the vaccine or some sugar uh, or some capsid, which is the casing around a, a virus. And because these vaccines only use specific pieces of the germ, they give a very strong immune response uh, that is targeted to keep to those specific parts of the germ. For instance, when it comes to the COVID vaccine, uh, it might be relevant to get the to produce a particular type of protein, which the virus uses to hook on, uh, sorry, to hook onto other cells, and use that for this type of conjugate vaccine, because that means that your immune system will start to target anything that has this protein chain and that then has uses this mechanism to latch on to other cells to reproduce and kills it. And so that would mean essentially also effectively targeting COVID. Um, these types of vaccines can be used on almost anyone that needs them, including people with weakened immune systems and possibly long-term health problems. One of the limits of these vaccines is that you may need booster shots to get ongoing protection against diseases. And just to give you a few examples, uh, these vaccines are used to protect against hepatitis B, against HPV, which is the human papilloma, papilloma virus, against uh, shingles, and also some other diseases. We have two more categories before I'm through. Uh, there's also toxoid vaccines. 
toxoid vaccines use, as their name might suggest, a toxin. Now, some germs, as it turns out, produce a toxin naturally. Toxins, as you know, are harmful to your to, to, to systems. Um, and so the germ that causes a disease also produces a toxin. The vaccines in question create immunity to the parts of the germ that cause a disease instead of to the entire germ by targeting the type of toxin that would be produced. That means your immune system will register any production of this particular toxin in the future and attack whatever is producing it, which presumably is going to be the germ. Like some other types of vaccines that I mentioned, uh, toxoid vaccines may require booster shots in order to get your to, to get ongoing protection against the disease. And toxoid vaccines are used, for instance, to protect against diphtheria as well as against tetanus. And finally, and finally, we're getting to the end of the list. Finally, uh, the last category is viral vector vaccines, the VVV. So viral vector vaccines mean vaccines that are transmitted, that, that in fact are carried by other viruses. So essentially, the way the process works is that you, you take a particular type of vac a virus called an adenovirus, and you change, you genetically manipulate it to change what's inside. And then you release it into the human body and the body produces an immune response. But because this is not, for instance, the COVID virus, the adenovirus is not actually going to, to, to spread as COVID does. It's not going to create the symptoms of COVID. But because the genetic code inside is that of COVID, partially, uh, it is going to be recognized by your immune system in the future. And therefore, it's going to be defeated by, uh, attacked and defeated by the immune system before it can spread and create the disease. Whew. That's a long list of different vaccines and different, uh, different treatments that can be used. Now, all of this is, is somewhat medical. And you might wonder, okay, so what's the point? Well, the point is that for the COVID vaccine, a number of these different uh, treatments or rather different strategies were attempted in order to develop a vaccine. As you saw, the mRNA vaccine was the first to succeed because Pfizer was the first to manage to produce an effective vaccine against COVID and it used the, COVID, the, the mRNA technique. But there are others like the viral vector vaccines as well that have been proven successful and effective. Going back to the previous topic, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine uses a, a weakened form of the virus, I believe. Um, and because of that, you might also get a bit worried about, the, about taking it because it's weakened, sure, but couldn't it wake up? What if, what if I'm particularly tired? What if I'm depressed? Will this have an effect on my immune system? What do I do if uh, I start to get symptoms? Should I call the doctor? Should I call the hospital? Now, all I can say is that you shouldn't worry too much. These, these vaccines would not have been granted emergency approval for use if they had been deemed to be realistically dangerous. I would highly recommend consulting uh, reputable sources online. Personally, I think that authorities are trustworthy. That may not be your point of view, but if you start from that point on, then that just leads you down into a rabbit hole of paranoia. So I tend to think that sites like the World Health Organizations or the CDCs or other similar sites, the European Medical uh, Medicines Agency's site as well, provide a lot of relevant and uh, reputable information that is reliable. So the first step before you actually get administered a particular vaccine is probably to find out which vaccine you're likely to get and what sorts of symptoms you might expect. In most cases, you're also going to get that explanation when you get the jab. Um, 
there's also some very good radio programs out there meant to raise awareness about the importance of the vaccine, about its side effects. Uh, one, for instance, on the Deutsche Welle, so on German radio, is called Science Unscripted, and it's available on podcasts, and is, I found, a very good source of information on uh, vaccine skepticism, as well as on how sci the science behind it works. Finally, just to go back to figures a little bit, um, I, I think it's important to remember to put things in perspective, as I said at the end of my previous speech. Uh, when you look at rates of mortality for all sorts of causes of death in the United States in 2019, you had a one in six chance of dying of heart disease. You had a one in 100 chance of dying from a fall or of dying from a motor vehicle crash. You had a one in 900 chance of dying from a motorcycle accident and a one in 4,000 chance of dying from a bicycle accident. I cycle to work every day. I have a one in 40,000 chance by my calculation of having any severe symptoms from the AstraZeneca vaccine. In comparison, Every day I cycle to work and cycle back from work, I'm exposing myself to a far greater risk. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop cycling to work. I psychologically feel that it's probably safer to cycle, mostly on bike lanes, than it is to take public transit where I might be exposed to other diseases. I also don't drive uh, because I feel like it's important to be mindful of the environment. Um, but from purely a risk point of view, car accidents are also up there because motor vehicle crashes kill one in a hundred people. So that would be even more dangerous. So if we really start to look at all of the figures, all of the statistics on deaths and mortality, I think rather than be disturbed by how easy it might seem to die of something, what you should take away is that you actually are always going to get something you are either going to get sick or you're going to get hurt. Um, or maybe you'll be lucky and uh, you'll die from the most common form of, uh, most common cause of death in the world, which is heart disease, after which is a stroke. None of us are going to get away from death. These vaccines are a way of living a much fuller life and hopefully getting back to some sense of normalcy, even though I'm sure that they're not going to remove the requirement to wear masks or to be careful or to wash your hands thoroughly. And so all I can say is, I hope that my speech was informative. I hope you found it useful to find out a little bit more about the different types of vaccines. And I hope that you were able to follow without gritting your teeth uh, because these topics probably raise the hackles on the back of your neck a little bit. Thank you very much.